good morning if you are in the West Coast, like uh, my colleague Jihan Tual and I are. Uh, good afternoon if you are in the East Coast, and good evening if you are joining us uh, from further east across the ocean, like our young colleague Mehmet Deniz is uh, from Istanbul. Uh, my name is Baki, Baki Tezjan. Uh, I teach history at the University of California in Davis, and I convene uh, the online meetings of the Ottoman and Turkish Studies Association. Today, uh, we are here uh, in the context of a Turkey Now meeting. And let me share my uh, screen with you so that uh, we can get going right here. Uh, so today we're going to talk about uh, who rules Erdogan's Turkey, uh, business power and the rise of authoritarian populism. Our uh, guest speaker is Dr. Mehmet Diniz. Um, and our discussant is uh, my colleague at Berkeley, Jihan Tual. Uh, and I'm going to do a little bit more of an introduction today than usual. The, uh, what I do usually is to remind you of our upcoming meetings. And I'll do that, actually, right away. This Friday, uh, we will have an OTSA co-op meeting where we're going to talk about uh, a newly published textbook, Writing a Short History of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, and we'll also talk about how it went in the classroom. Uh, so that is why they're usually teaching it in the classroom. Uh, the author of the book, my colleague Rene, will be joining us to talk about the book a little bit. And then uh, other colleagues, uh, Evren Altunkaj, Janet Klein, and Mustafa Minavi will be joining us to talk about uh, their experiences teaching it in the classroom last fall semester. And next Monday, we have our WhatsApp in Ottoman and Turkish Studies meeting. Uh, that will feature Ottoman religious politics in the confessional age, uh, a ER, European Research Commission funded research group led by my colleagues, Janet Kristic and Derin Karzoğlu. Uh, they'll share with us the work that they've been doing uh, with their team uh, that consists of several people, uh, some of whom will be joining us and their names are right here. I hope you can make one of those meetings. Um, I'll start with our discussant today, introducing him shortly. Jihan Tual is a professor of sociology at the University of California in Berkeley. Uh, many of you uh, would probably know him if you are interested in modern Turkey. His book, Passive Revolution, Absorbing the Islamic Challenge to Capitalism, uh, was, and I think still is, the best analysis of uh, AKP's rise to power in Turkey. Uh, his second book is The Fall of the Turkish Model, How the Arab Uprisings Broke Down Islamic Liberalism. And then the uh, more recent one, the third one is Caring for the Poor Islamic and Christian Benevolence in a Liberal World. Um, I introduced our discussion first because I'm going to talk about our uh, speaker a bit more than usual today. Mehmet Diniz received uh, his PhD at uh, Binghamton University, uh, State University of New York in sociology in 2019. He started uh, his undergrad as a computer science and engineering major actually in, uh, at Sabanju. And then it's probably toward the end of it, he decided to move into uh, humanities, so humanistic social sciences and did a made a master's in modern Turkish history at Boğaziçi with Professor Ayşe Bura, working on grassroots action against the Jekondu renewal projects in Turkey, the case of Istanbul Boşibüyük and Ankara Ditmen Vadi, a Turkish version of which you can read uh, in a press trip dedicated to Ayşe Bura, published by İletişim Yayınları. Uh, here are a couple of articles he published in English and peer-reviewed journals. Uh, he has actually more publications too, and he had actually started already teaching in Turkey, uh, most recently, I think, at Yeditepe University. Uh, so he was on his way, like many uh, Turkish students who come to the United States do, to get a job at a Turkish uh, university and have an academic career there. But so in order to do that, he had to apply to a 
uh, pH E equivalency. So uh, in Turkey, uh, PhDs earned uh, abroad uh, are approved by a sort of university institution, uh, an institution that is supposed to represent all the universities in Turkey called Universiteler Arası Kurul, um, URK, Inter-University Board of Turkey, you might call it. So uh, on May 4, 2020, he filed his application. Um, at the time that he filed his application, if you check the regulations that govern PhD equivalency in Turkey at that time, the content of a PhD dissertation was really irrelevant to grant equivalency. Uh, this is a very important point to note in this case uh, because uh, you know he had a full file. Uh, his file included everything that is required uh, from a uh, application to an equivalency. And it was supposed to be a very sort of procedural uh, thing. You know, you go, you check boxes, and then you're supposed to get your equivalency. But that's not what happened. On November 26, 2020, that is six months after uh, Dr. Dennis applied for the equivalency, the committee that is responsible for processing applications for equivalency in PhD degrees, as well as associate professorships and full professorship titles, they wrote to three schools of law at three public universities in Turkey. Two of these public universities are in Ankara, both of which were founded during Erdogan's rule. And the third one is one in, in Istanbul. Uh, and they asked, to determine, they asked these universities, law schools, to determine whether the content of Dr. Dennis's dissertation um, constitutes a crime. The first set of responses are very interesting and are also interesting in themselves to think about how regular academics in Turkey are trying to deal with pressures coming from above to make decisions on a certain way. Uh, so the, the, uh, one of the public universities in Ankara, the School of Law, they just didn't know what to do, I guess, because it was very unusual, I imagine. Uh, so they did not respond for almost two months. Uh, but then UAK sent them a reminder. We are really looking for that response, speed up the process. So then a, a group of five faculty members from the law school wrote a report. And in the report, they said, well, you know, the, the, the, the, this is a topic in sociology. And then it engages also with political science and economics. So we are a law school. And then uh, you're asking us whether the content of the dissertation constitutes a crime. And they said, well, that should be evaluated by the relevant authorities, they said. That is, you know, they, I guess they didn't spell it out, but it, they meant uh, pr a public prosecutor's office. One of the five members, the one who is the coordinator of the group, wrote a separate response. And in that response, he did give something that I guess you are, you are here at this point in time would be interested in hearing, and I'm going to get to that point, why at this point in time, um, they, uh, this gentleman said, well, um, you know, the uh, question of whether the assumptions, claims, and statements contained in the dissertation, as well as the methods of data collection used in the study are in accordance with scientific criteria is debatable. So he sort of threw out something there, but then he added, but you did not seek our opinion on this question, and he passed on. Um, the second public university, uh, there, the dean of the College of Law, he responded himself without uh, sort of delegating it to any faculty members, saying, well, this is in the field of sociology. We are a school of law. We cannot evaluate this. Even though the question they received was about whether or not it constitutes a crime, I think this response shows us that there are still people in Turkey who are trying to do their job as honestly as possible. So it's a very good response when you think about it. 
And then the third response came from the public university in Istanbul. And in that one, the, it's a professor of law. He says, well, you know, my foreign language is a German. Um, I read the Turkish summary and I assume uh, Mehmet had submitted a Turkish summary of his dissertation in his application. And uh, this professor says, I, as far as I can understand from the English, and as far as I read from the Turkish summary, there I cannot notice an element of crime in this. Uh, but he finished by adding that uh, uh, maybe a professor of criminal law who reads English uh, should be consulted. I see a message in chat. Uh, oh, background noise. I'm, I know I do usually not mute everybody because I find that uh, problematic, but if everybody could mute themselves, that'd be great. Um, all right. So then let's see what happens next. The first decision of the Universiteler Arası Kurul was about, well, you know, we received the three reports, will grant this equivalency on March 10th, 2021. But uh, Mehmet never received this decision. Uh, instead, something else uh, happened following, um, and that was from the public university in Istanbul, where only one professor of law had written a response, came a new report on March 30th. Uh, three faculty members, uh, they submit a report to their dean, the dean to the president of the university, the president of the university of the, to the university Kurul. And in this report, we read a Turkish translation of the first chapter of uh, Mehmet's dissertation, the concluding section of the fifth chapter and the sixth and concluding chapter of his dissertation. These are translated into Turkish and certain things are underlined. And here are the parts that are underlined in Turkish translation. I am sharing with you uh, the parts that are in uh, the, the actual originals, the English parts that are underlined. Uh, you, these are the parts. These are the statements in the dissertation that, according to these three professors of law uh, at this public university in Istanbul, uh, might constitute a crime. The authoritarianism of Erdogan's regime today is undeniable. Mass arrests, political trials, leading to a massive purge of state bureaucrats and suppression of most dissent have come to define Turkish politics. Indeed, the authoritarian character of the Erdogan's regime has been undisputable for the last 10 years. Later, it continued in 2010 with constitutional reform that empowered Erdogan to design the justice and military departments as he sees fit. The massive imprisonment of opposition activists around the Kurdish movement beginning in 2010, the violent crackdown of the Gezi protests in the summer and fall of 2013, the declaration of a state of emergency amidst the failed coup d'etat in June 2016, and its use to purge around 125,000 people from the public sector clearly qualify Erdogan's Turkey as authoritarian. And by the way, I should add, um, Mehmet has uh, citations following uh, most of these statements in parentheses that I didn't bother to carry over here. Unfair elections that occur along with imprisonment of opposition figures and violations of civil rights, such as freedom of speech and the right to assembly. And last, they support Turkey's invasion of Northern Syria under the pretext of clearing the region from US supported YPG militias. So these statements, uh, were um, underlined in the Turkish translation. And then uh, these three professors of law uh, recommended that, well, you know, these statements are, could be interpreted to be in defiance of penal code article 299 and article 301, as well as the act on the fight against terrorism article 72. So, denigrating Turkishness, denigrating uh, the Republic of Turkey, and interestingly, agreeing to serve in the army of a country which is at war with Turkish Republic or participating in an armed attack against Turkish Republic, act on fighting, uh, propagating a terror organization in a manner that would legitimize praise or encourage the application of its violent actions. So these three professors of law, when they saw those statements, 
pulled off these particulars, uh, these particular articles of the law and recommended that UAT, the, the Inter-University Board, might consider uh, submitting this case to a public prosecutor. And then, uh, and then they added the report, they, they, they said the dissertation lacks such qualities as objectivity, reality, accuracy being based on a scientific foundation, citing references and having controllable sources. As I mentioned, uh, the statements that I shared with you, many of them actually do have citations following them. And also overall, when we write something, we don't write a reference after every single sentence we write. Usually, we all know that. So it, that is, um, as you can imagine, not a very uh, persuasive point. More importantly, what happened while Dr. Dennis's dissertation was in the process of getting approved for an equivalency, the Inter-University Board of Turkey changed its regulations. On January 20th, 2021, and here I'm referring you I told you earlier that this date is going to be important. Uh, let's go back to the first report uh, from the public university in Ankara. On February 27th, uh, this uh, professor had written, well, you know, this is debatable. So at the point he wrote that, at the point he wrote that, the, uh, the regulations have changed. And now the Inter-University Board of Turkey now authorize itself to also evaluate the topic and content of a dissertation um, right here. Uh, so then uh, off they sort of took their first decision granting the equivalency to Dr. Dennis back. And that decision had never been communicated to Dr. Dennis. Um, and they issued a decision denying equivalency. And apparently they also filed a um, suit with the a, a investigation request uh, with the public prosecutor's office. Uh, Dr. Diniz um, uh, is pursuing uh, his rights to uh, court and uh, it's difficult to imagine uh, how the court would respond to this, as we know that, that the courts in Turkey are under a lot of pressure, but his case shows us several things, like how from the top pressure comes down to universities to act in certain ways. When uh, the universities don't respond that way, there's, there was probably some pressure came and then a second report was issued after the first one was all done and the, the inter-university board was ready to move on a second report came in. Um, and when we think about um, sort of the implications of this are scary. We, we had heard of stories of our Turkish colleagues in Turkey who are uh, advising their PhD students uh, not to touch on certain topics because it might not serve them well. We had heard such stories uh, very often. But now the implications of this story is that if we are advising a PhD student here in the United States. And if that student is planning to go back and work in Turkey, uh, I don't know what, what we are supposed to do, what we are supposed to tell them. I, I, I will just leave it at that. And I will um, pass the mic to uh, Mehmet Deniz, Dr. Deniz, for him to share with you a summary of his dissertation uh, and you can be sort of a judge of 124 people here to see whether there are any uh, elements of crime in it. All right, uh, Deniz, Mehmet, please go ahead. Okay, uh, let me start my presentation before, oh no, I cannot do it. First, I need to share. The thing, okay. All right, I thank, you know, uh, Bakitez John for his wonderful, you know, overview of my, you know, uh, my dissertation legal, I mean, dissertation journey or how it ended up under the hands of, you know, uh, Erdogan's authoritarianism. 
sort of prov proving my dissertation, uh, some sections of my dissertation. Uh, I mean, I re I'm really thankful for Bakhtesian probably I'll be using that in some, you know, international circles to uh, who wants a summary of what is going on, on uh, regarding my, you know, uh, legal proceedings. Uh, so, you know, I can have a, a few more additions and comments about, uh, about you know, uh, what has occurred to me, uh, maybe in the discussion section, but let me just jump in to the content and subject of my, you know, dissertation, uh, which the government found quite, you know, uh, problematic. Uh, so my uh, title is, or I mean, okay, the title, my dissertation title is Who Rules Erdogan's Turkey, Business Power and the Rise of an Authoritarian Populist. Uh, the dissertation was supervised supervised by you know Leslie Gates. I mean, I was quite you know uh, fortunate to have found her and to have her you know acceptance to work with me during my dissertation uh, journey. She was super you know helpful, uh, and she's still with me in this in this ongoing fight. Uh, I mean, to finalize my dissertation. Uh, uh, at least in Turkey, if not in the US or outside Turkey. All right, um, so let's seriously return uh, to the subject and the content of my dissertation. Uh, who rules Erdogan's Turkey? Okay, the quick response is uh, indeed this picture, which also appeared uh, on the flyer of this event. So this is uh, Erdogan, then I guess prime minister and now the president of Turkey appearing in the annual meeting of Tusiat in 2017. Uh, so he was giving, I think, an opening speech uh, for Tusiat. Uh, Tusiat um, has been uh, the voluntary, the most important, the elite, you know, business associations whose members are mostly, you know, uh, dealing on EU and US, uh, you know, geographies. Uh, they're also known as the quote unquote, you know, secular, modern, uh, liberal, you know, sections of, uh, of the business community. So in a nutshell, this is the response, you know, the response, you know, Tusiat ruled uh, Erdogan's Turkey, and they were also, you know, responsible uh, for the regime change uh, under Erdogan's Turkey. All right, what am I going to uh, talk about in this presentation? I'll be, you know, giving an overview of the, you know, the problem and uh, situate Erdogan's authoritarianism, uh, a, a puzzling, case, puzzling case within authoritarianism uh, studies literature, uh, followed by the argument and methodology, and then I'll go deeper into my, into the details of my research and the, you know, uh, arguments. Um, so so all about the dissertation is, you know, the authoritarian regime change under Erdogan. Um, but my question, major big question is, how did Turkey under Erdogan manage to make the authoritarian transition when in fact they were initially viewed as the democratizing princes of Turkey? I'll be repeating that fact, but uh, multiple times, but let me tell it again. Uh, Erdogan came to power, Erdogan and Justice and Development Party, AKP, came to power in 2002 with a politically liberal mandate, uh, rather than with a more populist authoritarian, you know, regime change. Uh, so I explored the business roots of this authoritarian regime change in Turkey, following, you know, uh, the discussion, the long discussions on political uh, sociology of, you know, uh, regime change. Uh, there have been, you know, some phases of this authoritarian populist process. Uh, of course, it was not just a sudden, you know, uh, event, but, you know, repeating the same, you know, uh, statements for five years, Erdogan was viewed and sort of adopted a, you know, more uh, politically and economically liberal framework, but started in 2008 with the massive purge of opposition bureaucrats in the justice and military departments. Uh, between 2008 and 10. So that was the sort of the initial phases of authoritarianism process in which some liberals start to question, well, I mean, is this, uh, is there something going bad in Turkey? Uh, and then it followed by the 2010 referendum that gave the institutional power to Erdogan to reorganize the justice departments. 
Uh, then came the violent crackdown of Giza protests in the summer and fall of 2013. You know, uh, and the final episode, which is still ongoing, uh, which we are still on, uh, the declaration of state of emergency after the failed coup d'etat in June 2016, and it's used to purge around uh, 125,000 uh, people. Why puzzle in case of authoritarianism? Uh, because in all the you know the cases of authoritarian populism um, since 2000s at least uh, the you know the parties uh, the governments that are I mean the parties that are coming to power uh, initiated rapidly uh, you know authoritarian trans uh, political transitions such as dismantling of the you know the the constitutional uh, checks and balances system uh, employing a more you know anti elitist populist rhetoric against the bureaucrats, against the old establishment, et cetera. But for the case of Erdogan, that wasn't the case. They were rather quite you know, uh, open about their democratic credentials. So they were trying to prove to the Turkish society and the state that they want to reform the political regime for a more democratic you know, um, type. Uh, and indeed, in that period, uh, especially in the English language regime, you will hardly find any criticism of Erdogan government, be it in a, you know, international media outlets or in a journal, you know, in an English speaking journal on Turkish uh, politics, you wouldn't be able to find any criticism. Rather, you would find real, you know, uh, very positive, favorable accounts of, you know, AKP's uh, presence and Erdogan's presence in Turkish politics. For instance, uh, this guy, you know, uh, writing in uh, the Financial Times was saying that the government is right to claim that Turkey's de democracy is growing stronger. The judiciary is undergoing for it painful reforms. All taboos are now the subject of daily controversy. Then comes uh, another person in the same newspaper who's saying that Turkey is emerging as a modern pluralist state precisely because such a course offered the prospect of entry to Europe's democratic community. It has become an exemplar for the proposition that Islam can sit comfortably with European values. Um, we also witnessed the same similar accounts uh, in scholarly you know, journals, uh, prominent you know, figures who used to work at the time in prestigious you know, uh, Turkish and you know, foreign schools. Um, such as, you know, Chalar Kedar at the time, writing in 2007 uh, in New Perspectives on Turkey, he was saying AKP's current vic uh, electoral victory and its subsequent success in electing one of its leaders to the presidency may well be the culmination of a long struggle in Turkey's political economic development to emancipate itself from the totality of the old Republican elite. If so, this will herald an enormous transformation of the political field toward a cooler and more normalized arena of you know, uh, discussion. Indeed, Chalar Kedar, Chalar Oja, was not alone you know, to, to make such claims. I mean, Chalar Kedar, Ahmet Insel, uh, Sheket Pamuk, uh, or Ziya Unish, all of them were trying to convince the Turkish public that AKP, Justice and Development Party, and Erdogan do not pose any threat to uh, to you know to Turkish political life. Uh, so, I mean, indeed, you know what uh, Chalar Kedar, along with others, hoped uh, was I mean proved true. I mean, uh, AKP managed to suppress the so-called you know old Republican elites from the bureaucracy, but this did not herald an enormous transformation of the political field toward the cooler and more normalized arena of discussion. Uh, so that's why, I mean, I asked, you know, how did such a neoliberal democratic regime fall five years after Erdogan came to uh, power? How was it possible? Uh, um, the problems of the existing accounts, you know, interestingly, because Erdogan and his, you know, uh, you know friends in the party, Co, you know, uh, co-founders of Justice and P Development Party came from, you know, Islamic background. Uh, I mean, they all, you know, pointed Erdogan's, you know, rela relationship with 
Muslim business community to explain both Erdogan as a Democrat in the pre-2008 period, as well as you know, Erdogan as authoritarian post-2008 period. I argue and showed based on my research that this is this is definitely ungrounded. You know, not Muslim business community, but the old, you know, quote unquote Republican business groups uh, organized around Tobent to see out where the responsible and the powerful actors uh, that draw Erdogan uh, into power, both in, you know, in pre-2008 period, as well as in uh, post-2008 period. Um, so I follow some authors arguing uh, the prominence of Erdogan's defeat of military justice alliance between 2006 and 2008 uh, to understand the post-2008 authoritarianization. So a few authors argue that, you know, the fact that Erdogan managed to suppress the opposing bureaucratic, you know, figures, the so-called military justice establishment, I mean, as I, you know, call them, uh, caused the later authoritarianization uh, process. Uh, so rather than taking this as the independent variable, I take this as the dependent variable to understand. So I try to understand how on earth, you know, did AKP manage to suppress the powerful military and justice bureaucracy? How was it possible? Because, you know, after all, wasn't it the fact that, you know, as many commentators viewed at the time, the Kemalist bureaucracy, the old Republican bureaucracy, wasn't, wasn't they, you know, wasn't, uh, uh, weren't they the most powerful and almost unbeatable element of Turkish politics? Uh, that was the assumptions at the time. So if that was the case, how did they lose, uh, I mean, against Erdogan and Justice and Development Party? So here comes my, uh, my argument. Um, so I argue that Tobe and Tusiat, the two major business associations, Top being the involuntary business, the umbrella business association, to see that being the, the elite, you know, voluntary business association, their support for Justice and Development Party in pre-2008 period saved Erdogan and AKP from falling prey to the justice and military establishment. So my argument is that, you know, without their presence, uh, Erdogan, uh, AKP would cease to exist in Turkish politics, at least, I mean, for some time. I mean, one can never, of course, uh, predict these uh, unoccurred events. Uh, I then explain why did Tusiat and Top support AKP? Uh, so after establishing why they, I mean, that they did, I then explain why they, uh, they support AKP. So I show that uh, Top, but especially more so Tusiat, rule Turkey uh, and to see at top fears returning back to the uh, destable politics of 1990s. So I'll you know enlarge you know elaborate on those you know two bullet points uh, in the rest of the discussion but let's talk briefly a little bit uh, I mean let me talk a bit briefly a little bit about my data collection. I had you know three areas of data collection. Uh, publicly available business statements between 1998-2008, uh, Turkey's decade-long IMF years. Then I conducted interviews, and then I also utilized sources showing material gain. I mean, I don't want to mention too much about it right now, but I rather, you know, I followed uh, William Dunholm's famous, you know, uh, power network analysis to to understand and show the existence of power uh, in in Turkish politics. Uh, so I made a content analysis of statements uh, of business associations between 1998 and 2008 in three newspapers uh, using one, you know, software. Uh, and then I also conducted a qualitative analysis of all the, without exception, all the business statements that appeared in Hurriyet online archives between 2002 and 2008. And then I analyzed all the annual reports of two major business associations between 1987 and 2008, Musiat and Tusiat. Uh, then I also, uh, you know, analyzed all the IMF, you know, documents on, on, on Turkey. I contact, conducted 23 interviews with leaders of business associations 
former economy ministers of uh, Justice and Development Party, uh, their vice presidents, uh, and high-rank economy bureaucrats in the Treasury and you know central banks. That bank. Uh, then three uh, three sources showing material gain. Uh, the top 40 major privatization bids over $100 million at the time. Uh, so I also checked engineering news records list uh, showing, you know, how uh, Turkish firms fared uh, in, in the first period of, you know, AKP. And then I also uh, analyzed, um, you know, Istanbul Chamber of Commerce's top 100 industrial firm lists uh, in both the year AKP came to, power and uh, the last year of AKP's first government. Um, okay, back to the, you know, the arguments. I'll just try to, you know, uh, show you two or three, you know, uh, excerpts from my interviews uh, and my content analysis to um, to make sure that, you know, Tusiat and Top actually, you know, uh, had AKP to uh, you know, uh, in their battle against the justice and development, uh, uh, against the justice and military establishment. Okay, there was this, you know, increasing political tension in Turkish society between 2006 and eight. That was probably the most important, together with 2016 period, pro uh, the most important, you know, uh, years. I mean, those two years in uh, recent Turkish uh, political history. Uh, there was a massive rise of a social opposition against AKP, which we call Kemalist opposition or Ulusalcılar in Turkish, you know, jargon. Uh, why so? Well, they were fearful about Turkey losing their independence vis-a-vis -vis the EU once it becomes, you know, a member of the uh, European Union. And more so, they were fearful about, you know, rising Islamism of Justice and Development Party at the time. Those you know authors, liberal authors, or you know, are I mean scholars who also you know, uh, whom I also you know took uh, many you know courses at the time. They were kind of ridiculing that you know uh, concerns about rising Islamism of AKP, but they were trying to convince the people that well, that's just about democracy. You know, they are conservative and they have the right so. But there were you know over I mean millions of people. Who at the time, you know, uh, opposed uh, the the first instance of rising Islamism under AKP, uh, and that tension led to various different, you know, events. I mean, which I don't want to, you know, bother you with uh, a lot. But the most important was, you know, it led to the Constitution Court's closure case in two thousand, you know, eight, uh, which was a failed case, uh, and after which, you know, AKP totally won the game, you know, the, the battle. Um, so I just want to, you know, port, uh, portray uh, at least two, you know, uh, excerpts from uh, my interviews uh, showing how, you know, important Tobe and Tusiad's support was uh, for AKP against its, you know, war with the military and justice uh, establishment. So that was uh, an excerpt from my top uh, interviewee. I mean, who was who was one of the top, you know, top people at the time in 2000s and still is anyway. Um, so he was saying, I know how many times I went to the headquarters of the Turkish land forces to meet with the generals as a representative of top. I remember how I talked about economics to the army generals. I warned them how disastrous it would be if they intervened in the IMF program or if they had any trouble with the government. I was telling them that we were going through a very delicate process and then we needed to be very careful about it. So um, basically, you know, he was trying to convince the generals not to, you know, commit a coup d'etat, you know, not to make any political intervention, military intervention to the politics. Um, and then, you know, in the very critical moments in the, uh, the case of AKP's closure in 2008, uh, my Tusiat interview revealed to my shock, revealed to me that, you know, indeed Tusiat, you know, made last minute intervention to, to save AKP uh, from being closed by, by the constitution, you know, courts. So I asked him how Tusiat at the time, uh, you know, reacted to the news of the Constitution Court considering about you know closing the party. So he said he strictly opposed it, raising his voice. How dare you close a party which got 27 of the votes? 
We reckon that if we let them close AKP, we would have an authoritarian administration afterwards, and the EU process will be in grave danger. And the European Union was also against closing AKP. But you know, these people do not listen to what the EU says. And they could indeed succeed in closing RKP. We avoided it with just one vote. A last minute intervention to the Constitutional Court changed the vote of one of the members, and we could prevent the closure. And I remind you that uh, eight members of the Constitutional Court, as opposed to the five, uh, accepted the fact that you know RKP uh, has become a source of Islamic po uh, policies. And the Constitutional Court accepted this. But because of you know falling one vote of you know short of one vote short of um, achieving super majority, uh, they were not able to close down you know uh, AKP at the time. And my you know interview was revealing to me that their last minute intervention was quite you know important in that uh, in that process. Uh, so I mean here is just my you know a summary of my content on so business statements reported in those three uh, newspapers. This is just to show you that you know it wasn't just you know to see at and top, but the majority, I mean all the business associations were in favor of RKPY by wild ma margin as opposed to their you know uh, discontent uh, for previous you know uh, governments led by I mean another you know part. Um, so in the dissertation, I then you know show uh, why Tusiat and Top support RKP. So here, after establishing that they did support uh, RKP in those critical periods, uh, uh, then I you know follow why why they you know supported uh, the party. So my argument is because they already ruled Turkey under Erdogan. Uh, how so? I use Damholm's power network analysis framework uh, to show that you know, I mean, Tusiat and Top actually ruled over you know Turkey at the time, uh, and I you know use you know those two sources. I show that Tusiat gained the most in that period, and Tusiat and Top, but more so, Tusiat won all the po policy battles against the rest of the business community. So he, who gained the most? I use three major areas of so material gain. You know, I employ those three, uh, you know, sources, rising global contracts of Turkish construction firms, uh, all major state-owned enterprises uh, privatized to Tusiat members, and Tusiat's rising share in top 100 uh, industrial firm lists. Uh, so there's this internationalization of construction firms in 2002. Uh, so in 2002, in top 225 international contractors, there were only eight, you know, uh, Turkish construction firms, uh, five of which were members of TUSIAD. TUSIAD was already overrepresented in those uh, lists. And when we come to 2007, uh, we see that, I mean, there are 23, uh, you know, firms, uh, construction firms, uh, and I mean, majority of those construction firms uh, were or right now are uh, members of TUSIAT. So there's an overrepresentation, still an overrepresentation of TUSIAT firms uh, in, in those lists. I mean, just a side note, by 2020, uh, by 2011, you know, Turkish construction firms became uh, the biggest holder of you know global contractors after China, um, but at the time, I mean, uh, they, they were still on the process of you know reaching to that you know point. Uh, so privatization of state-owned enterprises that was another you know the anyway uh, I'm not going to talk about that again. So the, these are fourteen uh, you know top uh, privatization contracts. Uh, above 100 uh, million Turkish, uh, I mean, uh, US dollars. Uh, so as you see, except the last, uh, the last, you know, uh, line, all the major firms were transformed to Tusiat uh, on Tusiat members uh, co corporations. So there's just Çalık Energy, which is called, you know, a uh, member of both Tusiat and Musiat, the, I mean, the popular known as Muslim Business Association. Uh, so, so this is the uh, Tusiat firms in top 100 industrial firm list of Istanbul Chamber of Commerce. So as you see, uh, okay, I'm sorry. 
So here in 2002, the number of uh, TCR firms were already quite a lot. It was, I think, 52, and it rose to 60 in five years. And the revenues is on this gray line. So it was above a little bit about $10 billion. And at the end of the per first period, it was $60 billion. So there was almost this, you know, uh, six fold, you know, increase uh, in the first period of, you know, AKP. Okay, so this establishes, you know, uh, the fact that Tusiat gained the most uh, from AKP's, you know, uh, policies and that in that period, there's, there's no mention of other, you know, association in those, you know, uh, in the in those lists. Uh, okay, so who won intra business policy battles? So in that chapter, uh, I still follow you know Dom Hall's you know uh, methodology to go and dig into the policy, the existing policy debates. I'm not going to enumerate and talk in depth about those debates, but I mean if you if you are curious about it, I would love to you know respond and more. Uh, comment on uh, on those policy debates, but basically there were 17 policy battles, uh, which I you know collected by my both I mean by my qualitative analysis of the business statements. To see that without any uh, any exception, won all the policy battles. There were a few cases of discontent between To see and Top, and in those cases To see won rather than Top. Um, so those were the, you know, the popularly known as Turkey's, you know, IMF years, the years between 1998 and 2008. Uh, that was a real, uh, you know, contentious issue. Uh, businesses had variegated response to IMF's uh, restructuring program. Uh, and the key battles uh, bit within the business community was around you know, monetary policy, primarily on exchange rate regime, uh, but lesser so on, on interest rates. I mean, the policy rates of uh, the central bank, which is still you know, a major issue for uh, current uh, business politics in Turkey. Um, so, okay. So, um, Tusiad ruled during the first AKP government because they, I, I mean, I showed that they actually gained the most materially and they won all 17 policy battles over other business associations. There is not any single, uh, you know, exception. And indeed, you know, that popular known as the Muslim Business uh, Association had multiple, you know, varied and opposing uh, demands from the government. And they were all overlooked by by Erdogan and the Justice and Development Party. Um, so that wasn't just it. You, you know, they ruled at the time. Uh, so that was partially the reason why they supported, you know, RKP. Uh, but indeed, the rest of the political spectrum uh, was also quite favorable. You know, quite you know happy to follow Tusiat's lead in Turkish uh, political economy. So the question is, why did they still, you know, uh, you know, support very, you know, closely, stubbornly uh, AKP against the justice and military establishment? So my argument is, uh, that's something that I, you know, uh, analyze in chapter five. Uh, so um, they feared about losing their hegemony over Turkey as they did in 1990s. Because you know, to see it hardly established its, its hegemony that it lost, it had, that it had lost in 1970s, by you know, sort of engineering a coup d'état in 1980s, September 1980. So they hardly maintained their hegemony, or rather, like brute force over Turkish society in 1990s, and it was you know uh, challenged by mostly the working class agitation. Uh, that started in late 1980s and that, you know, sort of, uh, you know, went through mid 1990s, I mean, almost until 1997. Uh, so there was this, you know, working class agitation for the rise of, you know, wages, which was totally contrary to the neoliberal, you know, uh, force uh, or growth regime that, you know, Tusiat initiated or Tusiat established over Turkish society in 1980s. Uh, but unlike, you know, late 1970s, Tusiat was not alone within the business community 
in creating an exit strategy from the political economic crisis that Turkey was in uh, in 1990s. So the exporters uh, organized around the Turkish Exporters Union, as well as MÜSİAD, the Muslims Business, Muslim Business Association, they had a competing growth model, uh, which totally challenged the growth model of, you know, uh, of TÜSİAD. I could again, you know, elaborate more on what those, you know, political economic, you know, growth models were at, at the time. Uh, but there was a, I mean, suffice it to say that uh, there was a real challenge emerging from the business community against, you know, against uh, TÜSİAD at the time. And um, TÜSİAD was quite frustrated with its loss of, you know, hegemony over Turkish or power over Turkish society in 1990s. Only with AKP's uh, coming to power in 2002, they established a real hegemony, you know, over both the Turkish society and also, you know, the business, you know, community. So they kind of feared that, you know, um, like, you know, returning back to those bad days, I mean, where there was, you know, a huge, you know, political instability uh, challenging uh, the, the growth project, growth model of uh, TÜSİAD. Uh, just to wrap up, uh, they did support AKP. Why they did, you know, against the justice and military establishments. So, you know, to stop, but especially to see at rule Turkey and to see at as well as top, uh, they were also, you know, quite close at the time. Uh, materially, if not ideologically, that's another discussion. They feared losing hegemony over Turkish politics as they had in 1990s. And that's why they really struggled a lot. I mean, uh, on the words of one of my Tusiat interviews, he was telling me that, you know, uh, the 40 years, in the 40 years of history of Tusiat, we have never had any, you know, uh, government which was, you know, that responsive, responsive to the demands of the business community uh, as, you know, AKP. So they did not want to lose it. Uh, so that's all I have to say on my, you know, uh, dissertation research. Uh, so yeah, I'll be happy first to hear, you know, uh, Dr. Twal's, you know, uh, comments on my dissertation and then, you know, uh, the possible questions of the audience. Okay, thanks for uh, listening. Thank you, Mehmet. Uh, Jihan, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Baki, and uh, th thank you for uh, thank you for inviting me uh, as a discussant. And um, thanks to Mehmet Dennis for this uh, great dissertation. I'll have a lot to say on the dissertation, and uh, Baki gave me 15 minutes to do that, but I just can't ignore uh, these legal details. Uh, can I be allowed to take a couple of more minutes just to co uh, comment on these, or should, should we go keep ahead? Go the ahead. Discussion? Yes, yes, please. Okay, okay. So, uh, I mean, th there's a lot to say. So I, I won't tell you everything that's on my mind, but I'll just focus on these four sentences and the fact that they could uh, constitute the basis of a crime and the denial of an equivalency for this dissertation. The, the most important thing here is that these four sentences are by no means controversial. There's a lot in the dissertation that is controversial, but not these four sentences. There is broad consensus in the academia and in journalism around these four sentences. There's hardly anything contestable here. They, they, they are you know, the statement of bare facts. There's hardly any interpretation in those four sentences. The non-consensual controversial parts of this dissertation problematize not the AKP, but TUSIAD, actually. And let me go one step further. Actually, TUSIAD and pro-TUSIAD establishment parties would be more disturbed about the, you know, if the, you know, if the data and the analysis in this dissertation were to circulate in public. So it is not actually the content of the dissertation on its own that is triggering this reaction in my interpretation. Now I'm moving a little into interpretation, but you know, I, I'm, I'm really going to keep it short. I think what's happening here 
is in, in the person of one scholar, uh, the, the whole ac academy is being targeted. Uh, so, uh, well, I, I can say more on that, but uh, just not, not to take more time, I'll, I'll move on to the content of the dissertation because there's a lot uh, of interesting things to uh, consider and discuss there. And I, I read it uh, really with uh, pleasure and uh, occasionally consternation. I'll share uh, uh, with you uh, those consternations too. Uh, so I think this is a great dissertation and uh, parts of it should definitely be published. And I think every academic working on Turkey should discuss the findings. Uh, so Turkey's governing party, the AKP, uh, has become a paradigmatic case of the authoritarian turn throughout the world. So this is not just about Turkey then. Since Turkey was once celebrated as a beacon of democracy in a troubling region, many analysts have been trying to explain how this authoritarian turn happened. And most accounts have focused uh, on the personality of the president, or uh, as uh, Mehmet Deniz just pointed out, uh, the president's illiberal links with uh, business cronies and or the deep-seated authoritarianism and the political culture of this country, even though I should state there are many exceptions to these tendencies in uh, Marxist and uh, neo-Marxist scholarship on the issue. Mehmet Deniz develops an alternative argument by focusing not on crony capitalists, but the established business community. And as you could see in the presentation, this is really the core contribution of the dissertation. So the, the, the thesis makes many contributions and let's start with empirical ones. Uh, Mehmet Dez presents a numerical analysis of the beneficiary, uh, beneficiaries of the AKP's first term, interviews with business leaders and a study of the Tusiad and top documents during the AKP's initial years. And I know this has already been mentioned, but since uh, there are people who do not follow Turkey very closely, I'll just remind everybody that Tusiab and Tob are the established uh, business interests in Turkey. And especially Tusiad are the bigger and more secular, uh, quote unquote, uh, non-Islamic non uh, bourgeoisie. In terms of policies, when it, when it came to disagreements between Tusiad, the secular bourgeoisie, and Musiad, the Muslim bourgeoisie, the so-called cronies of the president, the AKP always weighed on the Tusiad side. So that, that is what the dissertation clearly shows. There were several areas of contention between the two associations. And uh, on top of, uh, well, there, there's a bigger list, but I, I'll just mention uh, the value of the lira, central bank independence, abidance by the IMF standby agreement, interest rates, budget and current account deficits, and inflation. Uh, and the government sided with Tusiad on all of them, wherever there was a, a disagreement between uh, the Islamic bourgeoisie and the secularist bourgeoisie. These empirical contributions lead to the main analytical point of Mehmet Deniz's dissertation, that the main actor behind the authoritarian turn was secular business rather than Islamic business. The dissertation also makes theoretical contributions, bringing in Marx's 18th Grammaire, uh, the analysis of uh, Louis Napoleon Bonaparte, Lancas's analysis of authoritarian populism, and especially, uh, and, and I, I think most remarkably, Damhoff's political sociology. The former two, so the 18th Brumaire and Fulansas, have been utilized before in analyses of Erdoganism. But to my knowledge, uh, this thesis is the first to systematically use Domhoff for an analysis of the current regime in Turkey. And Mehmet Deniz also deploys world systems theory in a novel, uh, in a novel way uh, for the case of Turkey. In the conflict alluded to above between the secular bourgeoisie and the Islamic bourgeoisie, Musiad, the Islamic bourgeoisie, is the representative of labor intensive exporters, uh, or in the language of world systems theory, of peripheral goods. They export peripheral goods, so, like, you know, lower quality uh, goods. Tusiad represents capital intensive exporters or producers of core goods. And semi peripheral economies have become 
uh, have more dynamic political scenes, world systems theory argues, because of the bitter conflicts between these two factions of the bourgeoisie, which are not as divided elsewhere because they are not uh, of even comparable size in, in the periphery and in the core. World systems theory has been used before in the, in the analysis of the AKP, but not as fully in studying the conflict between Tusiad and Musiad. So I found all of these contributions uh, very helpful, uh, but we'll now move on to some critical observations. Uh, I, I'll note that, or I'll, I'll reinforce my point that the Damhoff and uh, world systems theory-based analysis is quite convincing. And I hope to see these uh, published in the forms of articles and perhaps a book. I think you know uh, scholars everywhere ha have a lot to learn from uh, these. Based on this dissertation, it is clear who held power in the first term of the AKP from a Damhoff angle, at least. Although in a couple of minutes, I will raise questions about whether the dissertation shows that Tusiad ruled in the Pulansasian sense. Despite this strong Damhoffian contribution, I found parts about Tusiad being the main force behind the AKP's authoritarian turn specifically, less convincing. So uh, just to repeat this with uh, other words, I, I do find it con convincing that the Tusiad ruled in the Damhoffian sense in, in the first uh, few years of the AKP, at least six years, maybe more. Maybe extending even into the current period in some regards, we can discuss that later. But I, I, I'm not sure they're behind the authoritarian turn. And I'm not sure the dissertation really shows this. It is true that Tusiad's and the AKP's interests aligned in these first few years. And both interests pointed in the direction of some kind of authoritarianism. But I think the mechanisms are much subtler uh, than those explored in the dissertation in linking uh, the authoritarianism of the AKP and the Tusiad. For example, you know, I, I have a lot to say here, but you know, I'm really trying to condense my uh, arguments. As critical political economy has underlined, neoliberalization diminishes the power and organization of the formal working class as well as of progressive urban movements and concentrates power in the hands of independent transnational or transnationally oriented institutions, such as the IMF or the Central Bank of Turkey. We can clearly see this in the first term of the AKP, but not after its so-called authoritarian turn. So uh, AK, the AKP is authoritarian in its first term in a different way than it was then it is authoritarian after its first term. And I think this is where the dissertation's explanatory framework runs into trouble. In fact, the AKP has always been authoritarian, I would argue, but in a quite different way, in its protusiad and its more protusiad phases, that is uh, between roughly uh, before 2010, roughly, and after 2010. To look at the same issue from a different angle, even though Mehmet Deniz diverges from most of the literature by emphasizing the role of Tusiad and Tob in Turkish authoritarianism, though, so the secular bourgeoisie in Turkish authoritarianism, and that is his contribution, he perpetuates a core assumption of the established literature. His account depends on assuming too tight of a differentiation between liberal democratic and authoritarian phases of the AKP. The pre-2008 era also witnessed rep repression of labor and ecological activists. And my work, as well as others, uh, other scholars, have documented these authoritarian aspects of the AKP's first term. This is not to say there was no change afterwards, but there was also continuity. Another issue I had uh, with this framework was the absence of the pro-regime masses in the explanatory matrix. So I do see the emphasis on Tusiad uh, as very important, but I thought it was too exclusive. Why doesn't the interests of right-wing masses factor into the stories regarding, for example, interest and exchange rates? 
The masses had their stakes here too, especially in the AKP's change of track regarding these two issues, the, the exchange rate and interest rate after the 2010s. A Plansas-based and 18th Brumaire based analysis would clearly require this. Peasants play a huge role in Marx's analysis of the rise of Louis Napoleon Bonaparte. So here we got you know, the first uh, part of the famous Marx book, but not the second part on peasants. Similarly, the study of pro-authoritarian mass movements and organization occup occupy, uh, occupies a central place in books and articles by Pulansas. Mehmet Deniz mostly focuses on the book of Fall of uh, Dictatorships, as, as well as uh, the other uh, huge theoretical volume by Pulansas, but does not bring in the other central empirical and analytical work of uh, Pulansas, Fascism and Dictatorship. In both books, actually, both in the Fall of Dictatorships and Fascism and Dictatorship, Pulansas distinguishes between Bonapartist and fascist regimes. Mehmet Deniz assumes, along with actually many other scholars, that, uh, that Erdoganism falls squarely within Pulansas' Bonapartism category. But Pulansas' main distinguishing future regarding fascism, mass mobilization, and organization constitutes a core aspect of Erdoganism. And it should be noted authoritarian mass mobilization of a disorganized kind is central even to Bonapartism. An 18th Brumaire, and Pulansas based framework that only brings in business interests is essentially walking on one foot. The other foot, the interests of right wing masses, is missing in this dissertation. So, one, uh, th a third core problem for me uh, is the analytical role sec secularist mobilization plays in this dissertation. So Mehmet Deniz's ultimate proof that Tusiad was the main actor behind the authoritarian turn rests on his dem demonstration of Tusiad siding with the government during the secularist Islamist conflict at the end of the 2000s. The dissertation's theoretical framework emphasizes, based on uh, uh, Pulansas uh, Marx, by contrast, the labor capital conflict which disappears from the analytical empirical account. But the, res res the resistance under sec uh, scrutiny is secularist and nationalist, not the labor and or democratic. And it's not a socioeconomic resistance, let alone a labor-based or a democratic one. Thus, Tusiad's cooperation with the AKP in its repression of this particular resistance really constitute proof of capitalist authoritarianism. It could be at best be called conservative or Islamic authoritarianism, but I have reservations even about that. To put uh, this differently, there is a logical leap in the dissertation. The business community's struggle against secular resistance is presented as proof of capital support for authoritarianism. The, the issue is not so clear cut. To see its backroom maneuvering to prevent a secularist coup d'etat and the shutting down of the AKP is presented as proof, as we also saw uh, in the presentation. But this is not this is not proof of authoritarianism. Actually, pro-Tusiad scholars have even used these as pieces of proof for the pro-democratic sentiments and role of the established bourgeoisie. This goes hand in hand with the Tusiad's more democratic stance on the Kurdish issue when compared to all other establishment interests in Turkey. Now, not talking about democratic or labor interests, but establishment interests in Turkey, uh, as uh, the same scholars have argued. So this is, an, this is not an analysis I agree with, by the way. So these protusiad uh, pro analysis, I don't agree with them. But I haven't seen proof or analysis against this protusiad position in Mehmet Deniz's dissertation. And I actually have more to say on this, but I, I really want to wrap up to save time for uh, questions and comments from the uh, audience. Despite these limitations, Mehmet Deniz's dissertation contributes to the literature on the AKP by showing that the established business class, not Islamic or crony businesses, held the reins during the party's first term. As importantly, 
the established business class benefited from the party's initial years more than crony capitalists. Not that the crony capitalists didn't benefit, but numerically speaking and policy-wise, the uh, secularist bourgeoisie benefited more. The dissertation also invites us to broaden our theoretical toolkit by, integrate, by integrating Dahoff's political sociology and world systems theory of not, not just its general framework, but the world systems study, uh, world system theory study of capitalist class fractions, which is a, a distinct kind of study compared to uh, other uh, critical political economic accounts. So Mehmet Deniz's account needs to be read and discussed so that we do not forget, and here's the practical implication, we, so that we do not forget the historically tight cooperation between two actors, the secularist bourgeoisie and the AKP, that are today presented as existential and mortal enemies. So that's all I have to say. Thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you, Jihan. Thank you so, so much. Um, Mehmet, you might have a response for uh, Jihan, or uh, should it, uh, I'm looking at time, it's 10, 11, and uh, I'm sure you would have some things to say in response to Jihan, but I also am thinking of the time uh, left uh, in terms of Q&A. So I leave it up to you. Would you like to respond, say a few things? Or maybe, we, uh, yeah, go ahead. Why don't you go ahead? Yeah, I'll, I'll spend a few minutes. Um, I mean, I, I think I'll have to, you know, re listen and take notes. Uh, Jian's, you know, comments on my dissertation, they were, I think, quite helpful. Uh, it's just returning back to my some of earlier discussions about, you know, how to frame my dissertation. I mean, the kind of dissertations that we did with Leslie and also, you know, Umit, who also sat on my dissertation committee. Um, so, I mean, uh, thank you for all the, those comments, by the way. Uh, okay, the first issue, you know, I think Gian Tual, if I am probably some criticisms uh, did not, I mean, I, I haven't understood some of the criticism that well, that's why I think I'll need to, you know, uh, really listen and watch those. But, you know, as far as I understand, you know, one of the first, you know, criticism uh, of, you know, Gian Tual was that uh, although, you know, uh, we see clearly in the dissertation that Tusset and Top uh, supported AKP in, in its fight against the just and military uh, establishments, we don't see or we are, I'm not convinced or he's not convinced that uh, they actually wanted that transformation. Uh, so whether they were really the agents behind this, you know, authoritarian transition in the sense that, let's say, to see it, according to many, you know, authors, was the agent of, you know, the neoliberal transition in early 1980s in Turkey. Uh, so the reason I, I, I think that's, that's a very, you know, uh, I think good reading of my dissertation. That's why, you know, the question in my dissertation is not why... Uh, Erdogan, you know, created an authoritarian regime, but rather how it was possible. The reason is that, yes, you know, I wasn't really able to systematically analyze why on earth, you know, the things ended up the way they ended up. I mean, why Erdogan and AKP really initiated an authoritarian, you know, term. So I really failed to give an empirical answer. Of course, I do have various, you know, readings of the process, but I failed to give an empirical answer to, despite my huge research, to the question of why they did it, or if they, I mean, or why Tusiat really wanted uh, a new, I mean, a authoritarian transition, if they wanted, maybe it was just, you know, the way, did the way, did the way that they did. I mean, they, they weren't really in control of it. However, you know, uh, I have had some unsystematic, you know, uh, you know, uh, accounts of uh, accounts in my newspaper uh, scannings and in my interviews that showed Tusiat actually wanted to have a more authoritarian uh, Erdogan government. Uh, first, you know, there are the statements of, you know, Rami Koch in 2004 and in 2005. 
uh, asking that you know the best political uh, regime for capitalism is dictatorship. So they will be most happy, the happiest in a dictatorial you know government. However, it is not possible in today's world. So the best, the second best option would be instigating, you know, instituting Erdogan as the you know powerful executive force of Turkey as the president uh, of Turkey rather than prime minister with weaker you know executive powers. So in two instances, both in 2004 and in 2005, Rami Koç, the you know uh, who was the head of the biggest you know family holding you know in in Turkey. Uh, wanted an authoritarian transition. And secondly, again, an unsystematic review in 2011 and 12, when the first instances of presidential regime change was starting to initiate in Turkish, you know, uh, hot debates, uh, at least five, six, you know, major Tusiad members uh, openly backed the presidential, you know, regime change. So they called for such a regime change, despite the fact that a few years ago, they did not support the, or they did not openly support, maybe they did, but they did not openly support the 2010 referendum change, as we all know. Um, so, I mean, uh, in, in a few of my interviews, as well as in a few of the accounts that I saw the instances of, uh, you know, of Tusiat, and I also included them in my dissertation, but, you know, in ad hoc places, not on the core of it, uh, actually, Leslie was, you know, advising me to to move it upwards so that it became more prominent. But I was like, well, I mean, this is just one, you know, example. Uh, so, actually, there were, you know, uh, a few, you know, uh, a, a few instances. Anyway, so the, you know, ultimately, that's I think correct. Uh, I cannot, you know, convincingly show that Tusiat actually wanted an authoritarian regime change in the sense that, you know, the Chilean business wanted uh, in 1973 or Tusiat wanted in, you know, in late 1970s. Uh, so this needs a further research or a more, you know, talented, you know, anthropologic study of, you know, Tusiat or business politics at the time. Um, so that's, you know, uh, that's why, you know, I, you know, limited my question to the question of how uh, it became possible rather than why it became possible. Um, so, but that was quite an interesting question because, you know, it just, you know, occupied me for months. Um, so AKP has always been authoritarian, not just before 2008. That's correct. That's also, you know, uh, a discussion that we made with, you know, Leslie. I think Leslie was also kind of, you know, uh, questioning me whether it is, you know, uh, using an Polansensian, you know, uh, framework, uh, you know, using the terminologies of liberal democracy. Uh, so I think there is a good, you know, a uh, good amount of literature, both in in late 2000s and also, you know, right now, that shows that there were authoritarian tendencies of AKP in early 2000s, especially with. I mean, vis-a-vis -vis its treatment vis-a-vis -vis the working class, you know, the informalization of the working class occurred, you know, in that period. You know, when did we have the massive uh, what tekel drainage, tekel resistance? It was in 2008, not in 2013 or 14, right? Uh, so well, I mean, the reason why I set the consensus on that regard is that I am following the more liberal framework of defining what is democratic and what is authoritarian. So I am on, on the you know, limits of borders of uh, defining liberal democracy as one you know, uh, divided between you know, the executive, the parliamentary, and the you know, justice uh, departments. I mean, I definitely accept the Marxist critique of it, even like the more you know, uh, power elite, you know, critique of it by, you know, Domhof or, you know, uh, C. Wright Mills. Uh, but still, just maybe to be under the, you know, discussion of authoritarian populism literature, uh, I take this minimal, you know, definition of what, what is a democracy. Uh, but I, I mean, I also accept the, you know, Marxist critique of, of it. I mean, who is democracy? Definitely, it is the democracy of the business class or the capitalist class. Uh, 
so the absence of the masses on the power block, uh, I think that, um, I mean, a few days before, you know, a few days before the, you know, dissertation committee, I reread um, Marx's account of, you know, Bonaparte's thinking that this question could come. Uh, it didn't at the time, but you know, uh, I'm happy that it, it did right now. Uh, I think the first reaction to that question is, you know, I think I'm guilty of bending the stick on the side of the politics of the above, uh, just to emphasize that, you know, it is not just the mobilization of the masses that matters for establishing the authoritarian politics of AKP. But what really mattered, or let me say what more maybe mattered, uh, was convincing, you know, uh, the, the business community, the fractions, some fractions in the capitalist class uh, for the establishment of, you know, Erdogan and Justice and Development Party's power over the Turkish state. So that's why I argue, I think convincingly to my taste, that, you know, uh, without the support of Tusiat, I mean, regardless of what it did regarding, you know, convincing the masses and et, et cetera, uh, AKP would cease to exist. Uh, I mean, this doesn't mean that it's mobilization of the masses, like, you know, sometimes, you know, earning landslide, you know, victories in, in elections, they weren't important. They were definitely important. I mean, they, they, AKP has always, almost, almost have been, I mean, until recently a popular party, if not populist. Uh, but without, you know, uh, capturing, you know, the, uh, the, you know, the approval, uh, the consent of the, uh, the capitalist class, they wouldn't exist in, uh, in Turkish, you know, uh, politics. I guess, I mean, you are right that, you know, uh, the peasants make, you know, an important, you know, uh, section of Marxist analysis of rise of uh, Louis bon Bonaparte. Uh, however, I think in the last section, in the conclusion, where he discusses about how things unleashed after Bonaparte, you know, totally, you know, uh, eradicated uh, the two, you know, legal parties, you know, the Orleans and the other, I don't remember, uh, the other, you know, uh, group. Uh, so he was claiming or he was observing at the time that Bonaparte appeared as the representative of the masses, the peasants, where in fact uh, it represented uh, the interest of uh, the manufacturing and financiers uh, in the in the uh, in the capitalist class. Uh, so, I mean, uh, he was still on the train of I mean trickery, I mean trickery or you know uh, fraudulent activity vis-a-vis -vis the you know the masses, but still following the you know the uh, the policies of, of, of the uh, of the capitals class. But still, I think in a more overall, a whole analysis of how AKP came and you know persisted in power definitely needs to employ how they also created their hegemony over the working class, which I think John Twal's uh, earlier book, you know, I mean terrifically, you know, uh, you know, establishes. Uh, so I mean, um, I think the last question was also quite interesting, you know, uh, like, you know, um, AKP sub or support for AKP wasn't about establishing, you know, uh, AKP's or the state or the capitalist class power over the working class as it did in late 1970s in Turkish history when the working class movement was so, you know, and socialist movement was so powerful, but in between 2006 and seven, as Gian Tual, you know, rightly argues, you know, it was, um, it was a more non, you know, class-based, you know, uh, you know, movements. Uh, I think uh, what I, you know, argue both in the, uh, in the theoretical section, as well as in the empirical level uh, is that uh, Erdogan became a Bonaparte, uh, by, you know, totally eradicating the old established guardians of the bourgeoisie. In the case of Bonaparte, it is the, you know, those two, you know, uh, dynasties. But in the case of Turkey, the just military, uh, you know, uh, establishment 
uh, for a new political representative, which is AKP. So the coup d'etat, using the you know the Marxian again the terminology, was not against you know the people, but it was against one section within you know the social bloc or the power bloc, as Polansas would say. So the the justice and the military departments. So the real issue was not, I think, for Tusiat that that was concerning was not, you know, more than a million people, you know, uprising against AKP was more about, you know, the danger of, you know, the military committing a, uh, the coup, coup d'etat or more so the a possible constitutional court, you know, case against, you know, AKP. So this Bonapartism argument is more about making stability within the sections of the, you know, the bourgeoisie or the power block. Uh, rather than you know uh, instituting the power of the the business class over over the working class, uh, but I'm not really sure in the empirical section that I make this clear enough. Uh, I rather I can try to you know make make it clear in the theoretical section rather than in the empirical section. Um, so, um, but again, I think uh, I'll be told. I mean really listening and taking notes and trying to create a better you know response to John Twal's you know mind blowing you know may, uh, may, may, I, may I suggest yeah. maybe that uh, Jihan emails you the written remarks and then you could use them uh, oh yeah that will be that will be wonderful I, I'm just I will definitely do that time and would like to uh, yeah. have a chance to uh, would like to have a chance for a few people to say a few things uh, because there a few questions came up in the chat yeah, there might be also people who would like to ask questions by raising their hands. So it would be great, maybe if we can move to that section. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, definitely. All right, great. So I, I actually would like to acknowledge uh, uh, a person whose name Mehmet mentioned several times, uh, Professor Leslie Gates from Binghamton University Sociology Department. She is with us. Uh, Leslie, would you like to say just a few things about uh, Mehmet's work or how, uh, I mean, you must have been shocked to hear that he, he couldn't get his equivalency. Uh, did, uh, did you have any experience uh, advising Turkish students before? Tell us a little bit about it. Binghamton has a wonderful history um, of uh, many Turkish students actually studying here in part because uh, Professor Chalar Kadar has been here or was here before he retired for many years. So I've had a ple the pleasure of working with many <laughs> wonderful uh, Turkish students. Um, uh, and um, let me just say, I wanted to thank you for putting this together and for Jihan for offering really, really um, substantive and really thoughtful um, commentary for, for Mehmet, Mehmet to really chew on. And that's just gonna be really helpful for his future um, thinking about publications and stuff. So thank you so much for that. Um, yeah, I mean, um, you know, I, I will just say that um, he came to me with this idea that, um, that Erdogan's sort of capitalist base, if you will, um, was actually, you know, potentially, um, you know, Tusiat and these establishment business uh, leaders. And I thought it was really intriguing and really counterintuitive that the, you know, the sort of bourgeoisie that, you know, would ostensibly, we, you would think would be sort of appalled and um, at, um, you know, at his, at his project and certainly isn't, aren't the, the capitalist that he espouses, that Erdogan espouses to be his base. So I just thought it was a really intriguing, um, intriguing idea and it was a great pleasure working with you, Mehmet. So thank you for that. Um, and I think his research, um, yeah, I mean, obviously we have to, we can't ignore the mass mobilization that is absolutely uh, important in understanding a kind of politics that is electoral, however authoritarian at the same time, right, um, in tendencies um, that, you know, we, we, we can never forget that there's, you know, that there's still a, a fraction of capital that is dominant. And we it still behooves us to interrogate that, to really understand, well, which capitalists are actually um, in power? Uh, because that's also a, a very, you know, a, a very political, um, it, it, it, it, it, 
it actually it in in this case it was it's very counterintuitive who actually were the capitalists that are you know that are behind this project so so you know let, let us all remember that in studying populists and in understanding populists we still have to pay attention to the capitalists <laughs> thank you thank you so much leslie uh there might be people perhaps thinking about raising their hands and if you uh -huh. would like to just take the floor by there raising your hand Feel free there are a few, you know, questions on the comment section. Yeah, shall exactly. we? Exactly. Um, That's what I was going to do. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to read. I'm going to go back to the beginning of the uh, questions and then read a few uh, while people might be perhaps raising their hand. Uh, one question that came up. I, I think two people asked this. So uh, Aras Koksal wrote to everyone. If we have time for Q and A, I'm curious how Dr. Dennis framed the goals of the dissertation um, to recruit to see at top uh, into uh, representatives for interviews. This question also received support uh, from someone else. Uh, along the same lines, I'm curious to know how to see at reacted to the actual finished dissertation. I don't know whether you shared it. Uh, and someone else was saying, I would like a second Aras Koksal's question. So could you tell us a little bit about how you framed your work to approach them and uh, whether or not you actually shared the results and they responded at all? Um, am I? Oh, yeah, I'm speaking. I'm not muted. Well, yeah, that was a r real challenge. Uh, I think I followed Leslie's advice on that. You know, she did a similar, you know, uh, you know, project on rise of, you know, Chavez in Venezuela. And it's, you know, relationship with, I mean, it's support based on, on the, uh, you know, Venezuelan business community. Uh, so, I, I mean, I tried to make it as broad as possible. I think I just asked them questions like, you know, um, I'm wondering how Turkish politics developed uh, in the first, I mean, in 1990s and also in, you know, the first period of, you know, uh, AKP and how business community, you know, reacted to this. So, so I said broadly, that was my, you know, um, my, you know, uh, curiosity. Uh, and then, you know, I gave, I mean, I gave people, you know, endless time uh, for whatever they want to say. And then I tried to remind them some of the, you know, uh, their earlier statements, what they, you know, thought about this and that, you know, because, you know, I was kind of, you know, more informed about what they said or thought at the time because of reading the, all their statements in the, you know, uh, newspapers. But sometimes I also had some problems because, you know, some of the, you know, interviewees were also academics, you know, professors who were advising, you know, PhD students. So they wanted more detail, you know, they wanted like the literature, you know, the research question, more, you know, detailed stuff. Uh, so I had sort of, you know, uh, problems about, you know, framing in those instances, but I think I use such as like, you know, the relationship between, you know, uh, capitalism and democracy, business community and democracy, you know, things like that, it's more like, you know, uh, this discussion. Uh, I haven't sent it, you know, to, to Seat or Top. Uh, I'm not sure if I mean, I never thought about sending it, you know, I'm not sure if they will, you know, be interested in, uh, well, maybe some of them, but, uh, well, no, I mean, only one, you know, one of my interviewees in Central Bank was kind of, you know, interested in my, you know, talk about politics of Central Bank, because he was saying that, I mean, almost every year one dissertation student approaches him, but asks more about, you know, technical stuff, stuff, such as, you know, how do you adjust the inflation rate for this, you know, inflation targets, you know, uh, you know, policy, rather than asking, you know, the business, you know, uh, institution uh, relationship. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to now take questions from the people who raised their hands in the order that they did so. So. The first one is Aygül Özkaragöz. Aygül Hanım, are you there? Uh, yes, I'm here. Please, go ahead. Uh, my question is uh, uh, actually a little commentary. Uh, first of all, thank you for, uh, very much for a very interesting uh, discussion uh, from all, all the participants so far, including, of course, uh, uh, and uh, first of all, uh, Mehmet Deniz. Now, uh, I agree with uh, uh, him uh, uh, that uh, Tusiat has been instrumental in the 
uh, original and long lasting, years and years lasting support of AKP. And I also believe that they, uh, AKP would never have come to power had it not been for the uh, staunch support of Tusiad. Uh, now, uh, I also believe that this is uh, the reason why they did this was uh, the uh, privatization. Privatization was uh, sort of stuck, uh, except for some small uh, uh, uh, entities, small kits. Uh, the major ones were not being sold, like te Turkish Telecom, to the uh, uh, Petroleum Office, and so on. So they, this is what uh, these were the big prizes that the uh, uh, Tusiat uh, members have always had their eyes on. Uh, the, the very first thing that uh, Menderes said uh, when he came to power uh, in the first few years, they were trying to sell off uh, these assets. Uh, but they just couldn't handle it at that time because that wasn't the uh, neoliberal order yet. Uh, so uh, I, I, uh, I support uh, Mehmet in his uh, thesis. Uh, and I also uh, uh, would like to ask him what he thinks about this privatization aspect. Uh, thank you, Aygül Hanım. Thank you so much. I guess that was one of the main uh, contributions of Mehmet's uh, thesis as Jahan mentioned that he demonstrates very strongly that Tusiad was the one who uh, won and uh, privatization is one of those things. Mehmet, do you want to say a couple of sentences maybe on this? Uh, uh, I would like to get a few more questions too, please. Yeah, yeah. I mean, very briefly, yes, that's that's definitely one of the major reasons why Tusiad you know, supported the government. And because of the, you know, the scope of my research, I only analyzed the period up until 2007, but I had the data you know, how I got the data is another, you know, funny story, you know, uh, it was sort of a, you know, thriller anyway, uh, but I had the data up until 2016 and I could, you know, uh, you know, follow that not just up until 2007, but up until 2016, to see members were, were I mean, got the line shares uh, from, you know, privatization bits. Uh, and more interestingly, I mean, I mentioned maybe about it in the, in that chapter, uh, AKP government uh, is the one that really privatized, you know, state-owned enterprises. You know, before AKP, uh, there were a few, you know, major enterprises. So it was the job of, you know, uh, Erdogan to privatize uh, Turkish state, you know, uh, firms. Thank you. And Thank you know, you. some of the long-term uh, results of that recently in Sparta as the whole city lost electricity for yeah. many days. Yeah. Uh, Pınar Bedirhan Oğlu was the next person in line. Pınar Hanım, please. Thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, I'm very sorry, Mehmet, for the fate of your dissertation. This indeed mm -hmm. is, is a clear reflection as it's discussed, the, the general uh, autocratic, dictatorial, fascist, however you would like to call, tendencies in Turkey. But my, uh, I want to make a comment uh, on a, a concept or on, on, a, on a use that both Jihan Tual and yourself made by, by mentioning the, the so-called um, I mean, small and medium scale enterprises, the Anatolian bourgeoisie in a sense, or the Anatolian capitalists as crony, but not the others. I mean, uh, because uh, we obviously tend to think that in that, I agree here with, with Jihan Tual, in that supposedly democratic period of the AKP, we don't know, for instance, how Tuprash was taken over or was, was bought by uh, a uh, collaboration or, Indeed, before the AKP, for instance, uh, how Poash, for instance, was taken over by by the uh, by by the uh, Doan holding, for instance. Later, the AKP uh, really, um, in a sense, struggled a lot to take uh, both Poash from, uh, from from from the Doan group, and indeed launched a big attack on the Doan holding media in overall. I mean, my comment here is not simply say that all these dirty capitalists in general, I mean, both the, the big bourgeoisie or the big capitalists or the others uh, are crony, but uh, trying to understand the crony basis of this relationship between the, the capitalists and, the, and the, the state might give us, give us a much maybe sounder framework to try to think about democracy within capitalism. I mean, uh, by trying to understand why cronism is 
necessarily at the heart of this so these social relations. Maybe we can understand why capitalism uh, can't really, in a sense, go hand in hand with a democracy uh, that at, that allows that invites the masses to to to to the involvement of politics even through elections. I think in the coming years or in the coming decades, we'll talk possibly more a lot uh, how, uh, not only in Turkey, but maybe in many other places, how, how maybe those mass uh, participation in politics should be, in a sense, uh, limited. Uh, because, I mean, all these masses are quite illiterate, are uh, incapable of really understanding politics, taking countries to uh, non-democratic ends, true democratic means, etc. I think there is a big discussion on, uh, I mean, uh, there should be a significant discussion on the question of whether really capitalist politics would like to involve masses in politics, but this turned out to be a sort of a necessary historical development in the long development of capitalism. I mean, I, I think that we should be cautious about dividing the capitalists in Turkey in between the, the, the definitely crony new ones, but also the old crony ones, I mean. So that's my general comment. Thank you, Pınar Hocam. Thank you so much. Mehmet, would you like to say a couple of sentences? Uh, I think I second slash uh, Pınar Bediranoğlu's, I mean, comment. I mean, I, I did not mention about it in my, you know, uh, you know, uh, presentation, but Jihan mentioned about it well, you know, good enough. Uh, that it, uh, indeed, you know, uh, the white, you know, uh, the Turkish business committee, not based on their, you know, Current chronic capitalist inclinations, but rather more on on which sectors that they are, you know, operating in. You know, whether they are in those sectors that bring peripheral, you know, returns uh, to to its owners, or those sectors that, you know, comparatively speaking, of course, uh, bring more, you know, uh, higher core, you know, benefits to its, you know. Uh, owners but talking about you know uh chronism i think chronism is just one important aspect of state business you know relationship you know one of the contributions that i try to make in the dissertation is that you know uh when we think about turkish business community or turkish business state relationship let's not just talk about you know chronism or chrony relationship you know that chrony relationship i also mentioned in my dissertation in my research but there's a huge arena of policy discussion uh, that really matters uh, for, for the business community. So it is not just about, you know, like quote unquote, the sultanistic, you know, leaders, you know, uh, distributing, you know, benefits to different, you know, sections of the society, including uh, the business community. But, you know, policies matter, I mean, even in Turkey. Uh, so, I mean, chronism, exists and is definitely important and even a more illegal type of chronism which is you know this mafia state you know it also exists uh it was illegal trade and etc uh but we shouldn't you know um miss this huge arena of you know policy discussion uh that is going on and which i believe more prominent to understand you know states you know capital relationship in uh in modern cap contemporary capitalism Thank you. Thank you, Mehmet. Uh, I, the next uh, question comes from Alexander Karapiteri. Uh, yeah. Please, go ahead. Okay. Uh, good uh, morning and good evening, actually, from Turkey's uh, friend. Uh, I thought you are, you are based in America. I would like uh, to ask you about the uh, distancing from Erdogan regime of the traditional uh, big Turkish industrialists. I'm speaking about the Koch group, the Sabanji group, the Yildiz holding, and so on. We have seen that Erdogan favor a kind of the emergence of not just the Anatolian Tigers, but some very, very big uh, companies in the construction sector, which is uh, have vested interest with the AKP regime. Do you think that uh, and not exactly all of them belong to the Musiad uh, Association. Many of them belong to the uh, Tusiad as well. Uh, do you think that uh, the fate of these companies, uh, because everybody is speaking 
about the next day, what is going to follow when the Erdogan's regime is going to collapse or fall down. Uh, do you think that uh, the fate of these companies or these industrialists is going to be a uh, break in post Erdogan uh, era? Hmm. Oh. Well, I mean, to... sorry. Uh, for example, we yeah. have seen that the pride of Turkey is the uh, Baikar holding or the Turquoise mm -hmm. or the Celik holding, which is industrialists which have personal relation with the Erdogan family. Mm -hmm. Who mm -hmm. is going to touch the Baikar holding, for example, even if Erdogan is throw, is the regime is fall down with a very uh, serious consequence? Do you think that the new situation or the new government is going to touch the old establishment, the business establishment? Um, I mean, basically, I don't think so. I mean, that's definitely beyond my scope of dissertation, but definitely I follow the, you know, the more contemporary accounts of business, you know, politics. Uh, I mean, one of the, let's say, you know, mild leaders of uh, the oppositional political groups, you know, Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu recently announced that, that you know, they will definitely continue to protect those, you know, uh, privileged sectors, uh, more productive privileged, you know, companies uh, that flourished under Erdogan. I mean, and he specifically cited Bayraktar, you know, the the company of Erdogan's, uh, owned by Erdogan's son-in-law. Uh, so um, I don't think, you know, uh, the cronies of Erdogan would be uh, that affected, except a few cases, I mean, Again, they also openly suggested that they will try to, you know, nationalize uh, the infrastructure, mega inf infrastructural projects of five major Erdogan cronies, the construction firms. Those are re really, really, you know, big names that already existed before Erdogan, but became, you know, you know, global names uh, thanks to Erdogan. But to see it, you know, uh, swiftly rejected it uh, after the you know, statements of uh, the opposition political parties to see that civically rejected that, you know, this will be a violation of the property rights. Uh, so they cannot, you know, nationalize uh, those, you know, uh, you know, mega construction, you know, projects or yeah, projects uh, that was done under, you know, Erdogan's regime. So, I mean, as they would follow you know, uh, is, is they will try to, you know, reestablish to set a little bit weakening, you know, hegemony in Turkish politics. I don't even think that they will try to, you know, nationalize uh, those, you know, measures, uh, the famously called, you know, uh, the five brothers or Beşiçete in Turkish, you know, five, you know, cronies. Uh, but that's definitely my, you know, speculation or reading of, you know, contemporary politics. Of course, we will see how it unfolds after, if it happens after, you know, uh, AKP falls down. Mehmet, thank you so much. We received more questions on the chat. I'm not going to be, I don't think we have enough time to go over all of them, but because people wrote them, I would at least like to read them because uh, yeah. it, it, since we post the video recording, we uh, are not able to post chat messages. So okay. one of the questions, uh, I think this one comes from, let me see, um, a, I'm trying to get to, yes, uh, this is from Kumru Toktamish, and I believe uh, she will be in touch with you, so she, you could actually discuss this question with her later. Okay. Uh, dear Mehmet Deniz, while you are citing Plantsas, it is interesting that your analysis of this direct connection between Tusiad and, their, uh, and the regime change very much reminds me of the Miliband side of the famously classical <laughs> debate on state and capitalism, she says. Silvia Önder is asking, where can we read about the humans who make up Tusiat? Has anyone written about them as individuals by name, by families, by networks with changes over time, etc.? Like the masses, they become a block in this presentation. Perhaps the 23 interviews show more particulars. Um, well, we just got Rahmi Koch mentioned. And then let's see. Um, Onur Kalkan is sharing with you a piece. Uh, uh, Mehmet Ojem, I just wanted to share that I wrote a master's thesis in Turkey at METU with similar arguments and chapters on the AKP's authoritarian tendencies. And my topic was centered on how the higher education system is transformed by the AKP in such a context. My argument was based on how institutions of higher education, including UAK, not only suffered, uh, 
uh, from, but also have been instrumental in AKP's dominant party rule and its economic developmentalist ambitions, apart from pointing out the hypocrisy that my thesis was a fruit, but not yours. Mm -hmm. I guess I am trying to voice the solidarity of people who know about the interwovenness of knowledge production and politics. Thank you for this wonderful work. Um, Nihan Uzun has a very specific question, which software was used for content analysis? Um, and um, Leslie uh, notes uh, that anyone who would like to support Mehmet, uh, please get in touch with her at lgates at binghamton.edu. Um, and then uh, Burju asks, would you consider Tusiad as still being Erdogan supporters today? Uh, so as I said, it's 10.50, we are well beyond our time, but I'm gonna give you two more minutes if you want to just say a few things about the most striking ones among these. Um, uh, okay, uh, so I mean, I I agree with, you know, uh, Kunru Toktamish's com comments. I think I'm gonna, you know, write, write her a, a bigger, you know, response. I, you know, selectively, you know, employ Polansas's state theory. I rather employ his, you know, power uh, block analysis rather than his more, uh, I don't want to use the word structuralist, but I mean, uh, relational analysis of, you know, state theory. Uh, so that's true, you know, by using Damhof, I am more on the side of, you know, Milibans. Uh, although I started, you know, this journey by, you know, overreading, you know, Polansas rather than, you know, anyone else. Uh, but the empirical, you know, project just, you know, anyway. So I think I'll be, you know, writing a more bigger, you know, response to, to uh, Kumru Hoca. Uh, so Sylvia and there's, um, that's not my, you know, uh, that wasn't my project. I took to see it as a class rather than as individuals. But they have really mostly nicely written, you know, biographs uh, of their life. Uh, I mean, I I used to read them before sleeping just for enjoyment and just to see how they, you know, straight their influence over politics uh, from 1920s up until early early time. I think it's a good enjoyable read uh, because I think they, you know, commissioned them to talented authors with huge, you know, amounts. So you know. Uh, they really do have, I think, good, you know, uh, you know, biographs. Uh, so, I mean, thanks for Honor Kalkan's, you know, uh, comments. Uh, so, uh, so, would you consider to see this still being Erdogan supporters today? That's the question of my ongoing, you know, re research proposal, you know, I'm trying to craft a research pro proposal uh, together with, you know, Vimit Akchai. So we'll try to analyze how things unfolded after 2013. So we kind of tentatively argue or right now that, you know, AKP changed course, changed its growth model from one domestic uh, consumption led to an export led, you know, regime. So we would like to understand the, you know, the business contours of that growth regime change. Uh, whether Tusiat is still supportive of Erdogan, I would, you know, say uh, no, they're not, uh, but that's not like, you know, um, they're totally against it, like, you know, the Venezuelan bourgeoisie against, you know, the Chavista uh, governments. Uh, so uh, the, you know, the software, I'm really sorry that I forgot which software I used it. I mean, I I need to look at the uh, web and not NV, Atlas TI. Yeah, Atlas TI. Yeah, it wasn't NVO, but it was Atlas TI, and I really, you know, enjoyed using it. It was, I think, also cheaper at the time, uh, but I don't know how it is right now. Uh, so, and it was also light on on on the comp computer. Thank you. Uh, Thank so you, thank you a lot for all the comments. I mean, I really, I'm really honored to have th those lots of, you know, comments, questions coming up. It really, you know, boosted my morale. Uh, I mean, in a, in a time that I needed the most. <laughs> we, we, we all wish you uh, the best of luck at the port. I, uh, it's difficult to be optimistic given the kind of political pressures that the university professors seem to have received to produce the kind of report that 
uh, ended up denying the equivalency, uh, it, it is not difficult to guess that the court will also receive political pressures. Uh, but we, we wish you all the best of luck. And in the meantime, uh, I, be I believe you are uh, in touch with scholars at risk. And mm -hmm. so uh, among the audience members here, if you think you know, your campus would have uh, a spot for a scholar at risk, uh, you might consider getting in touch with Mehmet and I'll be more than happy to con uh, connect you. Uh, and uh, Mehmet also just recently became a father uh, so uh, I, I also wish him a lot of luck with that uh, in this kind of a situation, especially uh, may, you know, I don't know what to say. Allah yardımcın olsun, kolay gelsin. Best of luck. I wish you best, best, best, best of luck. And I thank everyone for uh, staying all this time. I, uh, those of you who are interested in discussing a little bit more about our uh, recent vote, please stay. I'm going to stop recording right now after I say goodbye on the screen like this. Uh, have a great time and I'm looking forward to seeing you at another what, uh, WhatsApp or another co-op event next.